Dr. Martin. Um, so this program is called Bel Belmania. Uh, this project is called Belmania. Uh, this is the name of our system. It's a tribute to Richard Bellman, who invented dynamic programming. And uh, for dynamic programming is based on the concept that you trade off some computation time uh, uh, for memory time. So you, you have to, you do less computation because you store results and uh, intermediate results, but then you pay for memory to store these results. And if you look at this um, particular example of dynamic <coughs> programming, then you can see there are many memory accesses here, and, uh, and clearly, a very, very easily, this program is going to be memory bound because of all these accesses and relatively small amount of computation going on. Uh, so when we have uh, bound on memory, we usually use caches, but if you just try to naively implement it, you will find out that the, cache, the caches are not so effective. Um, so we're going to focus on how to improve the memory performance by uh, making better use of the caches. And we're, we're basing on uh, this research on a previous result, uh, which is called recursive divide and conquer approach to dyna dynamic programming. In, uh, and this, uh, before I show what it is, uh, this has the potential of reducing the uh, asymptotic uh, number of cache misses from n cubed to n cubed over a square root of m, where m is the size of the cache. So if we scale m, we basically get better and better performance for these algorithms. And how better? So this much. Uh, you can get almost an order of magnitude just by applying this and reducing the, um, the cache efficiency. And this result was presented last year at IPDPS, and later I will show you even better numbers. Uh, so I'm going to show how we, how we do this. And uh, we take this example. In this example, we have some recurrence which we want to solve as, uh, as a dynamic programming problem. Doesn't matter right now what is computed. Just believe me that it's computing something important, like some genes and stuff. Um, and uh, we're going we're gonna to do it using a two-dimensional array. And uh, if you look at the um, structure of this recurrence, then every cell, you, to compute it, you have to read some cells above it and some cells to the left of it. Uh, so I write it as min, and those two arrows, one goes to the left, one goes to the top. Um, and the way I'm going to uh, uh, inc improve the memory locality is by slicing the array into four, and then uh, uh, looking at each one of the quadrants individually. If we look at the first quadrant, then a typical cell in this quadrant will have to read those cells. So this is nice. This is just like the big problem, and you have some locality here because we only need to read cells from this area. So we just say, okay, this is a small instance of the same loop that we have above. Uh, if we go right a little bit, then uh, the situation is a little bit more complicated because we also have to read cells, read cells from the left quadrant. Uh, so we, st to improve locality, we make two small programs, one that only computes the minimum of the, cell, the, the red cells for each cell, and one that computes the, the minimum of the blue cells. Um, same thing goes for the bottom left. Uh, in the bottom left, you have those, uh, uh, the same thing, just transposed, so you have to read something from the top. Uh, so again, I split it into two small problems, but now it's a little bit different pro uh, program because it reads from above. And finally, this quadrant has both of them, so we will have to make three small sub-programs, uh, one to the left, one to the top, and one for the blue area. Um, so this already sounds a little bit complicated, but not too complicated. Uh, that's not it. So the killer feature is, and this is why it's called the recursive divide and conquer. Now, each one of those quadrants has inside it a computation that looks like the whole computation. So I can continue dividing it recursively into smaller parts and into smaller parts, and again and again and again until the blocks are small enough, and then we get a good locality, which, which means that when we do a small computation, everything fits in the cache. Um, that's nice, but that's only for the blue computation. What about the other computations? So yeah, we have to do the same amount of work, the same kind of work for them, and this is how it looks at the end. Um, lots of small computations scattered around, and when you combine all those computations, you get something that is equivalent <coughs> to the one very simple loop that you had at the beginning. Um, uh, and this is, this is where we come. Our goal is to mechanize the reasoning of how to construct those implementations and how to get a verified implementation of them. Um, if you just try to like, take your favorite verifier and try to like, throw it at this problem, um, it's, it's not going to work because those things have loops, they have recursion, they have uh, reasoning about the race, which we know is very difficult. Um, and okay, since this is the synthesis session, then we're going to solve it with synthesis. And synthesis, uh, when we think of it today, it usually looks like this. Um, there is a spec. At, uh, the user puts the spec into this machine. Then the machine has an interface that looks more or less like this. And then the machine thinks for a while, and out comes uh, the code. 
and the code is supposed to be correct with respect to this um, uh, specification, but I say mostly correct because different tools give you different guarantees for the, uh, for the results. So maybe it's only guaranteed until some bound of the input that this is correct. So we're going to um, um, suggest some an, an another approach, and this approach looks like this. You, the, you give the spec to the system. The system then projects uh, some, some version of the program that it can build from the spec. And then the user is going to work around and manipulate the spec in some ways and derive new specs and, and new sub, sub specs. And then it goes into a compiler that compiles the spec into, uh, into code, but also gives us the proof uh, because it can verify each step that the user did that it preserved the semantics. Um, so how is it going to be done? Let's zoom in, in into what's going on in the bo on the board. Um, it looks like this. You start with the spec on the left, and then the user works with the system. So for the first part, the user is going to manipulate the, the spec one step at a time, and it can derive one or more uh, specs for in each step. Why more? Because as you saw before, there are three sub-programs that had to be derived from the same specification, so we can get more than one. And uh, then the next step is a completely automatic step where the compiler just goes ahead and compiles each, each component into a, a C program and then composes everything together. Um, so notice that um, this is a, a program for experts. You see the user is ha has a PhD diploma. Um, <laughs> And it means that the user has, in their mind, they have the description of what the algorithm is supposed to do and how to get this performance. The system doesn't come up with it. The user has to bring it, but the system is checking every step so that the user doesn't make mistakes. And the system gets, uh, gets the user around some low-level details of how to actually implement it in C. Um, I just want to mention at this point that this work is uh, like joins a, a long line of uh, transformational synthesis work, uh, starting in like as, as old as 78 and uh, some more recent ones uh, every time there is some new system that does more. Um, so the, the first two are like generic trans derivational systems using deductive synthesis. A stream bi stream bit is uh, domain specific. It's specific to stream transformations and, and Fiat is, uh, uh, is like a DSL compiler that, uh, that compiles from a high level specification to a low level. Right. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna go to the technical part. And the technical part uh, is what it, how Bilmania does all this. So the first component of the system is a calculus, a language to express our specifications and programs. And this language is mostly Lambda calculus with some extensions. Uh, we have uh, this function abstraction term, which is like Lambda, but we use this arrow because it looks l like more familiar to people who don't know what Lambda calculus is. Um, we have a condition. And uh, a condition is a special term that evaluates to the value in the parenthesis when the condition is true and uh, bottom if it's not. So the, the, the special bottom value bottom on each type. Um, the slash is a branching operator. So if the left is bottom, it takes the right. Otherwise, it takes the left. And um, we have this just regular function application, which I sometimes write as subscript because we, we use function types to also represent arrays. So it's, it looks nice like this. Um, in total, what this code does is uh, what is, is uh, can be represented by this pseudocode. So what it does, it computes the top row and the left column of the array. Um, now we're going to go to the rest of the array, and the rest of the array looks like this. This is the program A. Uh, it's, it's computing some minimums, so we have uh, built-in functions for aggregate operations, min and max. Um, and we have recurrent recursion because this thing is defined by a recurrence, so this has to be a recursive program. Um, uh, you, those are the recursive calls in red. And as we know, uh, since we are PL people, we know that uh, recursion can be actually written as a fixed point operation. So uh, uh, down, b this is just syntax trigger for fix and then some big function. Let's look at this function um, because we like looking at functions. This, let's call this f. So what is the type of f? Um, if we run the, the some uh, inference algorithm here, we see that f is a function that takes a two-dimensional array, so it takes indexes to values, and it returns a two-dimensional array. So this, this fits the, the typing that we'd expect. Um, and what is the fixed point? The fixed point can be obtained by starting with an empty array, which I also mark bottom, and then I run f on it again and again and again until the result no longer changes, and this is a fixed point. All right, so uh, let's stay with this uh, idea of what a fixed point is. This function is going to be important for the rest of the talk, so I'm going to call it cookie. 
Um, and, uh, and now I'm going to talk about the next component of the system, which is tactics. Uh, and that is how to manipulate programs. So um, the first tactic I want to talk about is slice. Slice takes uh, a function and it, and it breaks it into small computations according to the, the coordinates that it computes. Uh, so I'm using the, the notation a little bit. This, this thing, uh, a function with something in the subscript is a condition on the arguments of the function. Um, so if I look at this, uh, we, I had fixed cookie. Now I can uh, replace cookie with four small cookies, each for a different part of the computation. Um, and what this code represents uh, can be thought of equivalent to this pseudocode, where you just, uh, for whatever you get an IAJ, you, you check which quadrant you are in, but for every quadrant, you just do whatever the original program did. And, but this is only the first step. Now, the second step would be to break this computation into one loop that does the first quadrant and then one loop that does the rest of the, of the array. And this is done by a stratify uh, tactic. And it, the start stratify works in two stages. The first stage, it, re it represents the program that it has uh, as, as a function application. And then it breaks it into two fixed points one for the first function, and then the result of the first fixed point is fed into the second fixed point uh, using a constant function. So in its fixed point, we have only one of them. Um, and why does it even make sense to, uh, to break it into function application? Let's look at what we had here. We had four cookies, one, one per quadrant. So I can, um, I can choose f to be a function that does cookie on the top left uh, and doesn't, doesn't change the output, just returns the same input. Um, and then another function is g, which applies f on the top left, and then applies cookie on the, all the other quadrants. And obviously, if, we, if you run, uh, if you compose g and f, you get four cookies, because this is what, what it will do. Um, but then if you apply this transformation at, at the top, you will see that you get uh, something like this. So fix of f is just compute cookie and don't touch the rest of the array. Um, and compute fix of g where this is bound to a constant, it means don't touch this value and, and change all the other three quadrants. Um, okay, so if you lost me now, this is the time to come back. Um, um, so we have this, uh, this program now. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't understand everything, so it means just first compute uh, the, third, the first quadrant in the top left and then fix, uh, do the rest. This uh, chevron is just, um, it just uh, composition, like uh, just application, but from the left to the right so that we can see the, the order of the computation. If it would reverse, it would be confusing. Uh, and this looks like more or less this pseudocode. So one loop that just, uh, uh, just touches the top left, and then one loop that touches all the rest. So um, let's, uh, yeah, this, this just um, corresponds to the cook to cookie at the top left. And this is all the three other cookies. So let's zoom out a little bit. Um, so, so far we had uh, the user. It's, uh, the user is specifying some tactics to apply, and then the system is applying them. But now uh, we want to do something better. What if we have several alternatives, and the user doesn't want to go and specify, oh, I want just one of them. I just want to say, yeah, pick one of them. And, the syst and we want the system to go inside and look at it and say which one of them will be the, co will be the correct one. Um, and this is the third tactic that I'm going to present, and the last one, it's called synth. Uh, and what synth does is, remember that I told you that the cookie at the top left is just like the entire computation constrained to the top left. Um, and now I'm going to formalize what this means. So A with those arguments at the top, uh, the superscript, it means that take the term that defines A, replace, wherever you see I, replace it with I0, uh, as the type, and wherever you see j as the type, replace it with j0 as the type. And this means that all the indexes that I ever touch are going to be in this range. Um, and uh, y since, it, since this only affects the types and not the actual term, you can think of those as type parameters. And, uh, and we're going to infer those type parameters as well as the fact that this actually applies. And we're going to do this by looking at this g at the top. So we're going to replace a fix with f uh, inside and with a, with a fix of a different function g, and we're going to infer g by using a sketch of this, uh, in this case, because this is the tool that we know how to use. And, uh, and, f and, and sketch is going to infer that we have to use a here and that we have to use those parameters to a. So uh, after we do this, uh, we, have, we can do more stratifies, and for each of them, we will match one of the results 
uh, that, ske that Sketch is going to come up with. And after we have done it for all of them, we're going to run a, a compiler backend that I don't really have time to talk about. And then it gen generates a CPP file. And this CPP file also has inside it some uh, low-level optimizations and parallelization directives that will make it efficient. OK, so just uh, before conclusion, I will show some numbers. Um, so for, th for those three problems that was, were in the original paper from 2015, uh, we almost matched the results. Sometimes we were even a little bit better. Uh, we also did two more, so you can see that there are speed ups. The speed ups are depend on the problem because not all problems have the same number of memory accesses. So sometimes you don't get as, as, as astonishing speed ups as other, other cases. Uh, I have this column that says that shows that if we do some more manual things, uh, we can get uh, better performance. But this is Belmayana doesn't do this these low level optimizations yet, but maybe in the future we can even get there. Uh, I, I also um, evaluated how hard it is to use the system. Um, so for each for each of those um, examples, you see how many phases, that is, how many subroutines you had to develop using the system, uh, and and how many how many uh, application tactic applications you had to do, um, and this is how many lines of code of C generated. So you can see that you need um, you don't need a lot of tactic applications relative to the number of C, uh, li lines of C codes, we know that if you wanted to ver verify this, usually it's at least one to one. So you have to write at least one, one uh, line of annotations per line of code that you want to verify. So this is a good ratio. Um, so we have, uh, we have some related work. Uh, the same, uh, this year, uh, Autogen uh, got published in PPOP, which is a, a, a different conference, but, uh, uh, but tra targeting the same problem, only that they're using dynamic approaches and not, uh, and so they don't have strong guarantees, but they can do it s fully automatically. I'm going to sp skip the other ones um, and just conclude here. So in conclusion, we had, um, we, we were able to synthesize code which is as efficient as the one written by experts, by the people who actually wrote the original paper, um, but this, it's also provably correct, and it's, the, and it's verified with less effort than it would take to verify the original code. And uh, we used an arsenal of technologies. Uh, we use those uh, subset types for the indexes. Um, we use rewrite tactics, which are common in proof assistants. And we also introduced automations using SMT and uh, a sketch, which is a CGS-based uh, tool. And uh, yeah, this is what I'm done.